You're listening to the Physio Matters podcast. This month, with the Association of Trauma and Orthopaedic Chartered Physiotherapists, and this is session 35. Welcome back to Physio Matters. I'm Jack Chu from Choose Health, of course, iPops, of course, and an ever increasingly small role in the Physio Matters podcast. I get a chance to do these bits and uh, conduct a few interviews, but many thanks, of course, as ever, to the Physio Matters podcast team who uh, are incredibly organised these days, and I massively thank them for it. Um, a really interesting turn of events has led to back-to-back Tobys on uh, the Physio Matters podcast. Not the most common name, but yeah, we, so we had Toby Hall in the last one and Toby Smith in this one. Uh, both of them PhD uh, physiotherapists and studying different things. And they both have brought incredible diversity to the podcast. You know, Toby Hall is a uh, known manual therapist and renowned manual therapist from the Mulligan framework. And Toby Smith is a renowned researcher in the field of um, physical activity and health, we could argue, um, in and around, particularly recently, in uh, orthopedics and scrutinizing data that showed activity levels um, in all sorts of populations. So, massive scoop to get both of them on the podcast huge thanks to toby hall for the last one very popular episode you guys have lapped that up and lots of commentary as well which is what we're after these days uh, on on twitter facebook and the like so be sure to uh, catch up with toby on on twitter as well as spitting out any feedback that might be left over from last month's episode but for this one, um, we we take a different tangent. Really, we we have managed to talk through all things osteoarthritis of the hip, the crucial questions as to when to take the plunge with with total hip replacements, what that means, what we know of uh, the populace when they have a hip replacement. Does that make them then more active because they're in less pain? Um, have we any misconceptions around that? What are the precautions that we should give? What are the consequences of these things? I'm I'm just paraphrasing an incredibly enlightening in conversation that me and Toby Smith go on to have uh, over the next hour and a half or so. So uh, I won't witter on for too much longer. Many thanks to the Association of Trauma and Orthopedic Chartered Physios, the ATOCP, uh, who have sponsored this episode and are incredibly supportive of the Physio Matters framework and our motives and they just seem to be happy to uh, bundle along with us on on this ride and this journey they've 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 they always give us such license and such support so uh, incredibly humbling to be involved with them and I've been a member myself for several years a hugely progressive group of people who are open to dialogue and discussion happy to disagree with with us and with others and so uh, just exactly where the profession needs to go and, and certainly uh, I would highly recommend becoming a member of the of their organisation as well as I'll mention at the end of the show about uh, me, and, uh, me and Toby talk a little bit about it. They, they do a, an annual conference which has some incredibly big names at it, um, always well, well subscribed to and, and well attended. So if you want to sneak on to the last few places on that, then please do visit their website and I'll give all the details at the end of the show, of course. But you won't it won't be hard to find um, through Google and then all of our Twitter feeds will be shouting about it. So certainly seek that out. And without further ado, let's get to the interview then with Toby Smith and the ATOCP. I'm delighted here to be at the Botnar Research Facility once more where we interviewed Sally Lamb. Uh, I don't need my babysitter Rob Ty with me this time, although I'm going to try and stomp it along. I'm fortunate to be here with Toby Smith, who I'm sure can introduce himself better than I can. But today we're going to talk in and around uh, with the, on behalf of the ATOCP. Um, I hope I've got that acronym the right mm-hmm. way around because they've changed it recently. Uh, but fortunately, they've given us the license to talk in and around our way and digress towards the equipment and precautions work that's come up around total hip replacements and um, some. Um, changes to conservative precaution guidelines which Toby's been working on so we're going to talk on a lot of things but hopefully get down to some nitty-gritty stuff as well so Toby welcome to Physio Matters and please do introduce yourself and tell your story so far if you don't mind. Yeah thank you very much Um, so I'm Toby Smith I'm a lecturer in physiotherapy at the University of East Anglia in Norwich. Um, My research interests are around 
um, musculoskeletal diseases in older people and particularly over the last couple of years around physical activity um, and the use of hip precautions and equipment for people after total hip replacement. Um, I still work currently um, um, at the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital on the trauma and orthopaedic wards as well um, at the weekends and I still come across every single time I work those patients who have a reluctance to be active and want to be more active and a couple of years ago that sparked the questions around well why are people active and not active um, and what can we do as physiotherapists to really be the advocates for physical activity and, and better healthy lifestyles on, around physical activity for this group of patients. Um, so with, at the time, we had Professor um, Kaf Sackley working with us at the University of East Anglia and, and together we started asking those questions and working on some of the work she'd done beforehand and, and taking that a little bit further. So yes, in the last two years or so, um, we've looked at why people have been active or not active. We've worked around work on a Cochrane review, which is published on, on the use of precautions and equipment and whether that could be associated with activity. But also in the last six months, looked at the relationship between physical activity and social, is social isolation for people with osteoarthritis of the hip and the knee and how that relates and changes over time for those that then have joint replacement. So it's really trying to look at the trajectories of physical activity or inactivity for people who do have or don't have a joint replacement and what we can do as physios to really try to improve that and optimise that in their rehabilitation and recovery. So mapping that journey almost on the, for, for where people digress on what decisions get made and how their lives then change without necessarily having to attribute cause. We've just got lots of data for us to look at and say, what can we tease out of this? So let's dive in there. I've got a really easy opening question for the actual real <laughs> meat of this matter, which is what is osteoarthritis? Which, of course, isn't an easy question. No, it's a really difficult question. So osteoarthritis is, um, well, it depends on what you read. I mean, my view of osteoarthritis is that actually is a pathology of the cartilage, um, which has, for one reason or another, um, lost its shape and its integrity to then be exposed so that we expose subchondral bone. And it's the subchondral bone and the changes of that subchondral bone that lead to pain and disability. And there's extra capsular and intracapsular changes as well that occur with that. Who gets osteoarthritis and, and the presentation and the manifestations of osteoarthritis are varied. So as we've just discussed about subgroups of patients, we can start, you know, there's subgroups of those people with osteoarthritis. And, and I think that one of the perennial issues around this is that is, you know, how do you diagnose it in relation to their manifestations? And, and the radiological and the clinical symptoms are, um, are really complicated. So we, we know that 25% of people or so will have very limited radiological evidence of osteoarthritis, but symptom-wise, they'll be in a lot of discomfort and that'll limit their activities of daily living. But um, yeah, it's in a nutshell, that's how I would personally define it define. at the moment. No, that sounds fair enough. The only thing, and, and totally reasonable position, the only thing I can think of to, to, to try and push back against is, is maybe the word pathology, just mm -hmm. to take us somewhere different. Because all of that totally makes sense in, in what we've come to understand. There is an argument and sensible pushback that is pathology appropriate for something that seems to be, in many, an inevitability of age, like a grey hair and wrinkles often get said. Now, we often say this to patients for various reasons, but if we're being academically accurate, yeah, it's not quite the same as that. But as a pathology... Could, could, where's your position in the fact that it could be something that, because it can be so symptom free, and people might live their life not knowing about this, and then, and yes, you would, if you were to suddenly grab them and x ray them, they'd, they'd have it, they'd, they'd be diagnosed with it, but it would be a pathology. Do you see what I mean? Where's yeah. your position? In I that? mean, I would, I would call it a pathology. Um, I think um, there's. Um, it's the symptom side of it that's important to me. So um, I wouldn't. I would only say someone has osteoarthritis if they have symptoms. Yeah. Um, so I follow the American College of Rheumatology recommendations that actually, yeah, they should have joint stiffness for twenty five to uh, yeah out of thirty minutes. They should have pain for three months. So yeah, and the the usual. Yeah. It's the symptomology that's really important from my perspective. I think the the analogy I suppose with the um, triangular fibre cartilaginous complex of the wrist. You know, we know that um, the disc in your wrist, if you're 50, chances are there'll be a hole in it, there'll be a tear in it. 
some people would say that's pathological. Actually, you won't know about it. It's pain free. You'd only know about it if you scan it or you have a problem with your wrist. And if you've got a problem with your wrist, then it's pathological. If you haven't got a problem with your wrist, you're not going to know about it. I don't think it's pathological. So, so the problem occurs, and we'll hold her on the wrist for a second. The problem <laughs> occurs is that you develop a problem with the wrist and then causation is inferred to yeah. the problem that was pre existing. Yeah. That can happen at the hip as well. Yeah. So we've got this underlying OA change. Yeah. Someone then let's go typical and say someone just steps off a curb or something mm -hmm. not realize it or miss it didn't realize they were at the bottom step so they jar themselves yeah and then they, they exacerbate an underlying process yeah that but, but once they're then say worked up and they're scanned or whatever that can sometimes then it, it, well you were just a ticking time bomb you've got arthritis you've yeah. had it for a while instead of treating it like the sprain that it might have yeah. been is that fair for me to yeah and i think i think that patient education is critically important and i think it's it's explained to a patient actually you know it might be that they had the signs of osteoarthritis the the structural features of osteoarthritis but it wasn't until they did something a fall, a trip, whatever, that actually meant that it became painful. And I think it's explained that to the patient, but then also then saying, if we can manage those symptoms, if we can get that pain down, then the aim will be then we can get you as you were That's before, you were. last week, before actually you noticed this thing at all. And I think we, we did some work a year ago around looking at the qualitative evidence of people's views and attitudes towards osteoarthritis. And time and time again across the world, people reported actually there was a lot of trivialisation of osteoarthritis oh, okay. and they, the, this belittling of osteoarthritis as a condition was actually quite frustrating from a lot of people's point of view because they felt it, they knew about yeah, it yeah. And, and when they went to their healthcare provider, whoever that was, and said, look, I've got this, this pain in my hip and it looked like osteoarthritis, the number of times when clinicians went, look, it's ageing, it's wear and tear, there's not a lot we can do. A lot of people found that really, really frustrating. So I think it's it's that clear explanation, which you know, physios historically, and we are good at, explain to the patient the pathology of it, the implications of it and what can be done. I think it's really, really important. Because they need to be reassured. Absolutely. But not belittled. No. As in, not the person belittled. They'd be mortified if physios did that. But yeah. Unfortunately, we have our anomalies. But the, the condition could easily be belittled yes. as a means of trying to reassure, yeah. which could fail horribly, couldn't it? Yeah. Because reassurance can be very important if that's explained properly. Yeah. If the condition is... But, but equally, I think as physios, we because of what we've come to learn, particularly in and around back, it's happening with shoulders, and then with OA as well, we are so conscious of our words that we sometimes try and sugar the pill so mm. much mm. that we're actually accidentally uh, belittling the mm. condition and not they might it might be a badge that they need to wear for a bit. Yeah. They, they might need to come to understand it they might want to know the pathological processes yeah. that we're trying to skirt from as if they as if that in itself is going to disable them when, yeah. it, when it could empower them i think so i mean if we take the example of diabetes when you go to your gp and you're diagnosed with diabetes the term diabetes is used with the idea that actually that will then hopefully educate the patient about the condition and their lifestyle changes and if they need to take medications that they're going to take their medications if we didn't do that for osteoarthritis and didn't call it osteoarthritis and give it a medical term of a pathology or osteoarthritis then there is evidence to suggest that patients will then actually not take it that seriously. They won't do their exercises because they're difficult. They won't take their pain medications regularly. So all the things that could help them, they interpret as being either pointless or not that important because actually it isn't a real disease. That'll disenfranchise them from the system that is Absolutely. really helpful for them. And if we do that, if they distance themselves too far from the, the medical side of things, if we call it that, if we sit within that framework, we know where they go. Mm. They'll find alternatives in the alternative medicine front. They will go towards unregulated care and treatment and be lied to by charlatans and then even well-meaning people that just live outside of our, mm. our understanding. So we need to make sure we capture them and then try and reform what that means. Mm. And, and I think that's a real mm. common message we've had in many podcasts mm. and it certainly sits well here. When it comes to what we've come to understand about causation of the actual radiographic changes, in that I mean... Are we, are we comfortable within the idea that it takes for an old cartilage injury, shall we say, that then, that then predisposes to OA? Have we mapped the genome so we know it's a genet mainly a genetic predisposition? Are they wearing out their activity? Patients are often worried about that. I thought this was coming. I played football in my teens and they think that means it's inevitable. Where are we at? Because I really genuinely yeah, don't no, know. And I think, I think 
the challenge of osteoarthritis is it's, it's so heterogeneous in its makeup. So there are patients that will have a genetic predisposition. There's a familial link. There are patients where there's a metabolic element to it. There's patients that where there is a trauma, behaviour, sporting type yeah. aspect. It's funny, we, we, I work with the University of Leeds and Professor Phil Conaghan and we published a paper a month or so ago that was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine and it looked at sporting relationships to the, the risk of developing osteoarthritis and what we found actually, the dose and what you do didn't make a real significant difference. What, unsurprising to us I suppose, does make a difference is if you have an intraarticular injury then actually you're more likely to get osteoarthritis. So you can play football. If you're one of these really lucky people that escapes injury, fantastic. You'll probably be absolutely fine and dandy according to our results. But if actually you have a meniscal injury at some point, you, know, you rupture your ACL and you have a cartilage injury, yeah. then actually then you are predisposed to develop osteoarthritis. Yeah. Um, so in the same way as we feel really comfortable that if you have an intraarticular fracture, and the articular surfaces aren't beautifully aligned afterwards, you've got a really good chance of getting secondary osteoarthritis, traumatic osteoarthritis. We, everyone feels comfortable about that. Am I right in thinking mm. they've extended that as well to even if they get a good alignment, they're still, it's still predisposing, so it's the actual injury that, that changes sort of the metabolic picture of what's going on there? Or the homeostasis. Picture, yeah, the homeostasis. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that, that, again, me talking sort of with semi-knowledge of that, mm. I thought that it was both when they don't necessarily get a well-aligned picture that they only have to live with, but even when they do seem to get it spot on, it seems to have disrupted homeostasis adequately so that they're still predisposed. Have I got that right? To a certain extent, I think where people feel comfortable is that, again, they'll be, depending on the physiological makeup of that person, it depends on how well they'll heal. I think one thing that I say time and time again I remember I had an anatomy teacher when I was an undergrad and he used to say the body never forgets and he's absolutely right I think so yeah even if we we repair and recover particularly soft tissue the body never forgets that and it'll come back and haunt you when you're 20 30 years time probably um whether I've got evidence to really support that yet different well, interesting, but... interestingly we know that neurologically we could we could make a case for that as well mm-hmm. both so you both the matter and the and the wiring, shall we say, mm. uh, to use metaphors, mm. might both have that memory, that underlying mm. sort of recollection of what's gone on there, and, mm. and there could be consequences that come of it. How about genetic predispositions then, independent of activity levels? Has that been something? Is that something that we can understand causation better in that? It seems to be, at least anecdotally, familial in, in, to some degree. Is that is that being sort of shown scientifically? Yeah. Again, there's subgroups where that fits beautifully um so there's genetic link there's there's certain phenotypes of types of osteoarthritis where that that is the case or not again it doesn't seem to fit for everybody but um there's that's definitely the case the the, i think historically when we look at the epidemiological evidence around um family history and and um, hereditary links is it's how and how and what we ask is the question. So, you know, any MSK physio, when they do their past medical history, will say, have you got any osteoarthritis in the family? And the patient will say, oh, yeah, my granddad had rheumatism. Or they'll have, oh, yeah, they had, they had jointy problems, didn't they? And it's like, well, is that jointy problems? Is that clinical radiological osteoarthritis? How comfortable do we feel that that's osteoarthritis? And I think, you know, evidence-based practice and evidence um, and research is coming leaps and bounds in the last 20, 30 years. And I think now we're getting decent cohorts where we can actually track that far better so so we have big data sets like the osteoarthritis initiative in the states we've got the czech study we've got um you know cohorts from rotterdam and amsterdam and and the framlingham study where we're they're looking at big populations and actually being able to answer those sort of questions so if we can fast forward 10 15 20 years we'll probably know the answer oh, i'll be back Absolutely. <laughs> we'll still all be here. I'll be back. I'll be asking it, and we'll just have more head-scratching questions <laughs> on different topics. We don't want to linger here for too long. Are there any scientifically verifiable strategies for the prevention of OA hip? So either for changes or for symptoms. So have we got anything in which, I mean, I can come up with a few that I often tell patients um, that I feel I can confidently lean on. Um, from what I've come to understand and read, but has that been put together necessarily in guidelines? I think we can feel comfortable about um, symptoms, particularly. Um, so I think no, 
I think the current recommendations are around weight management, exercise, um, and I'm just about to say diet, um, but definitely weight management and exercise, particularly in relation to actually people who are more physically active, um, who have um, good joint range of movement, but most importantly have good muscle control and, and muscle function. Um, those patients are, are, I'd say, less likely to develop the symptoms of osteoarthritis. Um, and I think where the mismatch comes in is where we relate that to radiological features as well. Um, that, that doesn't necessarily save them from the changes. No, no. Um, but it might be that they have radiological changes, but actually their symptoms are pretty good. So, you know, we'll, we'll do an AP view of a, a pelvis, we'll have equal looking horrendous x-rays radiologically, but actually there'll be one hit that's pathological and one hit that isn't. And, and it happens time and time again, doesn't it? Mm. But um, the diet thing's interesting. Um, I work with Brendan Stubbs, who's based down in, in London, and um, we've recently published a, a paper with an Italian group looking at Mediterranean diet and osteoarthritis, and there appears to be actually those people who are more adherent to a Mediterranean diet are less likely to develop osteoarthritis. So again, there's something about what we put in our mouths and, and our diet, and as well as our lifestyle and, and our behaviours, that does then seem to impact on development. How, how, how are we able to attribute causation to the diet there? I mean, scientifically, how were you able to work that up to make even that assumption? Because it becomes an awful lot with that, doesn't it? If you could find someone who lived had a Mediterranean diet that also lived the lifestyle of your control group, yeah, that'd be beautiful, wouldn't it? Well, that would be that would be us tinkering too too closely to these subjects. So instead, there's these other extraneous variables, such as the way that they go on to live their life. They tend to be more active as well. How did you manage to tease that? We out? try to adjust for that. We try to um, take match cohorts. So actually, we try to to take people who are more adherent to a Mediterranean diet and those who are less adherent to a Mediterranean diet, and then match them for all. The characteristics that could try to account for that so their age their gender their socioeconomic group those features that what about could... say their weight or their sleep quality or some of the things that we yeah, this... to understand about symptomology yeah because I, I really almost want to jump on it i want to think like that that makes sense and we know that general wellness and then we know that how important diet is to that but then part of me just thinks i could get carried away mm. on it um, and, and start prescribing these mm. diets or whatever Instead, I'm just sort of thinking, could it be that that makes them just generally well, makes them sleep better, mm -hmm. therefore makes them less likely to have symptoms manifest, have they got better psychological well-being, yes. which we know feeds into symptoms. So again, devil's advocate and it makes me sort of look deep I, into it. I think to save you from getting grey hair, Jack, you should <laughs> feel comfortable about association rather than causality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if, we pick, <laughs> if we go on association, life becomes a lot more easier um so yeah um but I, I i completely agree i think particularly features like sleep where i think we don't recognize enough of the importance of sleep hygiene uh, and particularly for osteoarthritis where sleep is one of the biggest factors um then actually i think sleep and fatigue um are, are critically important and you're right the study i've just mentioned I don't, we didn't adjust for for those factors just because they're often difficult to adjust okay. for but you know they are really important potential candidate variables that could affect that outcome. So, well, yeah. no, no matter how much you adjust for, there's always a sub like me that will find something. <laughs> in. And that's the nature of the beast. But it's certainly uh, something I haven't read and something I look forward to mm -hmm. reading because it's a classic case where common sense sort of makes you think that why wouldn't it have a factor? We've just talked about physiological sort of makeup and general pe people's wellness to heal after an injury mm. way back when and then their, their wellness in general of how their body's homeostasis is working makes sense for how their symptoms mm. might manifest knowing what we know about the greater things of pain mm. it would it'd be weird for it to not be mm. involved but how involved is yeah. it yeah i think from from that our most convincing hypothesis around that with this paper was around the potential anti-inflammatory um, effects and mediators which that Mediterranean diet may offer okay. the body and I think that links from an MSK perspective quite comfortably so I think that was the most um, concrete hypothesis we had from the literature. It certainly feeds in yeah. nicely it, to, our, to that pathology model yeah. um, and then we we'll need to work it up it's new stuff so mm -hmm. yeah brilliant and um, we'll certainly direct as listeners to that. Um, it, it's something that we I reckon we not necessarily, it might be me and you, but we'll podcast on this separately, I think, just to tell the listeners. But there's been this notion that younger people that might 
especially with our Tesla 3 MRs and stuff like that, they're finding symptoms that they were finding what they consider to be relevant features that, that they didn't used to think were that relevant. So people are sometimes having these, and I'll be honest, it's mainly privately, they're having these, these arthroscopies as a means of what was proposed to be uh, preventative. When they say they've got a slight ephemeracetabular impingement or they've got slight dysplasia, there's this notion that this can be tinkered with as a means of stopping you developing OA. Um, I, that sits, I'll play my card, sits really badly with me, mm -hmm. coming to understand the body and the mind and the, the way in which they interplay. I, I, don't, I don't like that. However, I need to be open to it, particularly as an ESP. People are asking me these questions mm -hmm. a lot. Where are we at with that? Just if you could give me a two minute pitch. Yep. <laughs> so you're absolutely right. There's been a, a real boom in the use of arthroscopy um, and FAI um, around hip pathology. And I think from a mechanical point of view, it makes sense. This idea of a cam and a pincer deformity leading to abnormal loading, leading to osteoarthritis. It? It, it makes perfect sense. I think the practice of it and the realities of it, I think, are still developing in our knowledge. Um, we've got um, big trials being run out of the Oxford and the Warwick group um, um, looking at, I think, the, the trial that comes to mind is, is the fashion trial looking at the use of arthroscopy and, and, and scopes around um, femoral acetabular impingement and then addressing those surgically. The evidence is still coming out and I think, again, if we could fast forward five years, I think we'll know far more. But I think the other thing that we would know in five years, and this is what I'd really like to know, is what happens to those people over time? So we're making this assumption that actually it's going to change the morphology of that hip. It's going to improve that and therefore you're less likely to develop that. But we, you know, do we know that in enough numbers to actually feel comfortable that that is the case or not? So well, you're the man that can though. You could grab that data. You've been known to mm -hmm. look for data that had been otherwise left on a shelf and trolled that. Do you feel that that might be, a, obviously you're a busy man now, but do you think that could be a direction that you could maybe... I think definitely, I think it's somewhere. something that we, yeah, I think it's something that we really need to know um, because it will determine what we to counsel our patients early on. Um, and I think yeah. that's really important because we're often the front line to actually, for people to come and say, okay, right, yeah, I've got this. I've got either no hip pain, but I just happen to have a pelvic MRI and it picked up this. What should I do? And, and you, we have to be evidence-based in what we do. And I don't think we've got all the tools to be able to give a really informed answer. We end up explaining the situation to the patient, drawing a nice diagram about the hip and the mechanics of it to the patient, but actually not being particularly convincing about, okay, well, what is the answer? We give them two answers and we yeah. say well you, you pick it there's yeah. so many morphological changes that mm. we've come to understand aren't as relevant as we once thought mm. when it comes to the manifestation of symptoms how that changes the actual okay, and can we make a difference mm. to it finding mm. it out is all well and good mm. can we do something about it mm. and how relevant is it mm. are questions we when we've tried to ask that in other parts of the body it's turned out that they're not as relevant as we once thought mm. even if they were we can't do too much about them in the right direction yeah. and when we interfere sometimes we do wrong I'm not saying we need to just learn that and rule out that question around the hip, but for me, I do on the side of caution, and, and I feel comfortable doing so to say, lessons from other parts of the body tell us that, that we're not very good at tinkering, mm. and when they're not that relevant, when yeah. we're working out in the end. Do you think that's a I safe think, position at the moment, or am I being a bit of a wuss? I don't know. No, I think, I think some days I'm in complete agreement, and then other days I think, well, okay, if... if say there's something in this and there might very well be course, yeah. um, and it's then saying well what we could do we could do an operation for somebody in their 30s and that might then prevent them having hip pain and needing an, a hip replacement in their 50s because if they have a hip replacement in their 50s well it's going to last 15 years so they're going to need three or four revisions potentially in their lifetime and they're big scary operations and i think any way that we can um, fine to manage and prevent needing a hip replacement I think is a, an appropriate thing hip replacements are fantastic great operations work really really well but I think I, most people will feel comfortable that actually if we can manage someone's symptoms or manage their condition so that they don't need to have that then so be yeah, it sooner keep it than have one absolutely, absolutely. what about though because I, I, I know what you mean about that and I can understand because mm. that, that bites on back of my neck because I've like, said we, what I've said yeah. are we, are we are we withdrawing some? Are we keeping some yeah. impre impressive care from people when we could uh, we could intervene? But then could it make it worse? Mm. We've come to we. It's the logic that we applied to the medial meniscus 
uh, and other, the other lateral, of course, but just generally we, we, we've come to understand that that sometimes can add further disruption and potentially worsen the situation. So whilst we don't know whether it does help or whether it hinders, that's why I think we're so torn, isn't it? Yeah. Because um, I think what you've just described is why we should keep looking. Yeah. And I get frustrated when people try and shut down lines of inquiry such as that. So we should definitely keep mm. searching because it could well be that that ends up being a really mm. important thing that we find out. Mm. So certainly look into it. But while we're looking into it, I think there's, a, there's sometimes a lot of salesmanship as if it's the next frontier of, of, of um, surgical medicine mm. that I think needs to be a caution and a critique applied mm. to. So. That's yeah. my offense, I so. think I think I feel uncomfortable about those people who have an operation when they're asymptomatic. So if and I, I can't imagine it happens often, but say that patient who had an X-ray scan and they had a cam or a pincer deformity, and and the surgeon says, actually, look, I can do an operation that means that this is going to prevent the development of osteoarthritis. That feels uncomfortable because actually that patient's asymptomatic. Especially because I think I have seen that quite a bit. Not that they never had symptoms because mm. it's weird that they have a pelvic injury. That exactly, but yeah. They tend to, I've had it where they've they've developed some symptoms, recovered from those symptoms after a few weeks, as as happens sometimes. But that's been an incident, not incidental finding. Well, what I'd consider incidental finding that mm. they've attributed relevance to. Mm. That means that then they're not operating on the asymptomatic patient that has. I have seen that quite a bit, and mm. I agree. It's hugely uncomfortable to us. It is. We're not the people holding the scalpel, absolutely. so we would easily say no. that. Absolutely right. So and the it, third man in the room who does hold the scalpel might have something more yeah. to add about their own anecdotes. Uh, and it'd be and it'd be interesting to hear that really, because I think you're right. We we don't know the viewpoint and the reasoning for that decision, and I'm sure they've got an incredibly good reason because no one has an operation or doesn't operation if they don't need it because it's a risky procedure, no. and it's also. The, the, the fourth person in the room, quite rightly, is the patient. So it's, it's actually, well, Absolutely. it's, it's what what's, the patient's belief about what that operation's going to offer them, what the benefit that patient's uh, operation's going to be for them, and, and also what the, the risks, but also the benefits of the operation could be for that patient. So uh, knowing what that is as well would be Definitely. fascinating. Yeah, it's funny because like, you're right, the first fourth person in the room is the most important one, yeah. but equally imagine their uh, headache if they were party to that conversation because it's it's so up in the air and it's so easy to make a case on each of the part positions we've just said they, they need to be only party to the summary aren't they almost yes. because if they i mean as much as they've got access to our material if they were to listen to physio mass and like they'd think well, we're clueless <laughs> because we're because we're trying to critique ourselves so no, that totally makes sense we've covered it already my next question was going to be well established body work an incredibly popular work that mm. shows a poor distinction between radiological findings and symptoms. Now that is across various parts of the body, yep. and we've already touched on it, so it does apply to the hip from what I understand of the literature. Mm -hmm. And therefore, how should the best practice assessment and diagnosis of OA hip, where should that lie? You've sort of said with you, symptoms and the guidelines on Yeah, the, symptoms, the so symptoms, absolutely right. So it's all about actually pain and symptoms. So um, pain, fair. Three months period of time localized to that joint um, or the, wherever the joint's affected with stiffness as well. Um, how much stiffness? And how much should range of movement of the hip when I'm assessing someone that's manifesting with something that's ticking all my boxes subjectively? Yep. And then I look at that. You say stiffness. Is that what they describe as stiffness? Yes. Or, right, patient sorry. reported stiffness. Absolutely see. right. So okay. patient reported, rather than restricted range of movement, patient reported stiffness. So, so they might right. be able to get full range, although right. it's unlikely. But if they could get full range. Um, but actually, it, you know, when they're sat and they're watching Corrie, for instance, you know, and they get up during the ad breaks, is it, you know, do they have to wiggle it around a bit? Does it take a few steps for it to loose off? Or, you know, most often when they go to bed and they wake up first thing in the morning, does it take about, you know, to get to the cup of tea and read the paper for the first, you know, page or two for it to go and settle down? I think really, if we so studied the validity of the noise of, oh, <laughs> I can have 100% <laughs> sensitive and specific. Absolutely. Sat watching Corrie for half an hour, yeah. you make this noise, oh, yeah. And then a little limp around. I can sympathise, yeah. right? If I look to saw, I can, I can sympathise. So no, that makes sense. So stiffness, you're right to differentiate stiffness and range of movement. Have we studied restricted range of movement of the hip well enough to sort of determine how co well correlated those things are to symptoms and, and radiological findings? Um, for the symptoms, yeah, I think we feel pretty comfortable about that. It's, it's funny because it seems crazy, but the hip is really not a hidden 
um, part of research, but it's really overshadowed by the knee massively. So actually, and the back, as and well. the yeah, yeah. yeah okay. So it's um, for, if we take the example of, of trying to find an evidence base for osteoarthritis from a physio perspective, you can go to the knee, and you'll find shared loads of evidence around what we do for the knee. You go to the hip, and you've got like two trials to play with. It's so small. You can, you know, to counteract that, there's a lot of evidence around hip and knee. But if you just want to look at hip, actually, it's quite challenging. So I think Kim Bennell's group in Australia have done a little bit. But again, it's probably all about the knee. So the, the hip really is a, is a, a forgotten joint from a conservative management point of view. And a, in an orthopedic surgical point of view, it's very different. But, um, but yeah, no, it always surprises me from that point. And do you have, when we're doing that, then we're, so we've just pressed fast forward a little bit because it's come up in conversation, but we've, we've got these subjective subjective markers and um, that, that, that we'd, we'd come to understand about stiffness and, and pain isolated to a joint, and then we'd, we'd naturally have the sense to sort of map that onto a hitch. So we won't be thinking that immediately at an 18 year old, we might well do in a 50 some. And so we've got these, these subjective clues. Uh, and if there's any real particulars, please chip in if, yep. if there's any other subjective ones. But we've then mapped that onto an objective assessment, which includes, say, a range of movement assessment. Now, am I, when, when we're looking at, say, rotation in a flex position and we're looking at those combinations of movements, um, are, we, are we fair to always check side by side? If we've got an asymptomatic hip and a symptomatic hip, we know that both of those might have similar radiographic changes. So is it the eliciting of symptoms with those combinations of movements or is it the stiffness relative to the other yes, side? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Always, always look on those both sides. Um, but just to give you a picture about, you know, is there, is there clear morphological symmetry or not? But also, that's important from a symptomology point of view. And you'll often get, well, actually, it can vary massively, can't it? Can't it? But if you do get that asymmetrical asymm pattern, it's fascinating for the patient to see straight away. It reinforces this idea that actually something's not quite right. Because particularly lateral rotation and medial rotation, they rarely see that actually happening. You know, people rarely go supine with their legs at 90 degrees and someone waggling their legs and rotate it around. And they can see straight away, wow, that one goes low, that one doesn't. So you're reinforcing this belief that actually something isn't quite right there. Confronting, yeah, yeah. You're confronting them with their own body yeah. sometimes. Yeah. And also then... Um, Helping them to map that onto the X-ray. Yeah. Show them how often they say we should. They say we shouldn't have slogans, but I've got plenty. But they say structure isn't destiny, and to show people that, and to show people the differences that can yeah. be, you know, we've also got changes here, and you've never had any problems with that. And yeah. What does that therefore mean to the bigger picture of symptoms? Is quite useful. So that's really interesting. Have I missed out anything there subjectively, which are real key clues for people when they're mid-subjective as to what's screaming out to you? Yeah. Away? No, I th I think. Pain and particularly on weight bearing. Groin um, pain? Is yeah, that... groin pain. Um, I think night pain is often. Night pain I think is really important because that tells me straight away of something about the impact of this on this individual's life. And and when I'm cons when I consider night pain, that makes me think, okay, this is really you know this is going up in my list of severities yes. if we if we put it in that term. Um, um, gait. Trendelenburg gait will be the obvious thing, particularly on that uh, chronic hip pain. We'd often see that. Um, they're probably the big features that I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested in. There's more and more evidence coming out about fatigue, though, um, that actually people with not just hip OA, but hip OA in general, um, with fatigue being a big problem, and for people and how that relates to what they can do and their capability to it's exercise as well. I mean, I've got so much interest in that across mm. various things we have from what i understand from chatting to some of the researchers on it hugely difficult to try and tease out what is induced by these conditions and what is because of the pain they're not sleeping yeah. well and yeah sounds messy it's, so we won't go no it and much. with that you then also got well actually have they got fibromyalgia as well and <laughs> then and all the comorbidities are around mm. fatigue so yeah we, we can park that one if we, you we can <laughs> for, another, for another day which is certainly worth mentioning to mm. and certainly people need to be recognizing mm. it because it's a question we can easily mm. miss out isn't mm. it we get stuck in as a well we, we get used to the questions we ask and mm. we, we're searching and chasing in around mm. pain but it might not pain matter sometimes it isn't always the their primary concern no. the pain I can deal with yeah. it's just feels like he's draining me. Yeah. You should dive it. Yeah. I think the, the other thing, and we've, we've touched on it throughout, is is actually trying to gauge, particularly in that subjective, trying to gauge actually what are people's views on that on the situation they're in. Sure. So, okay, what, what do they believe around 
osteoarthritis, what, what are their views around exercise, what are their views on conservative management, or actually, uh, do they want an operation? Um, because hip and knee replacements are, are in the media every single day. We usually know a cousin or an aunt or a granny or a granddad or Bob who lives around the corner who's had a hip and a knee replacement. So everyone feels familiar about this. And, and the public, I feel, you know, quite rightly have said, well, actually, hip and knee replacements, they're really, really successful. They work. I've got hip pain. I need a hip replacement. And actually, we know that only 25% of people that have osteoarthritis of their hip will need a joint replacement. So actually, it's a quarter of people. So three quarters actually don't need it. But it's working out in not that subjective. Are they one of these people that actually think they need a joint replacement? Sure. Uh, or are we going to have to give them some education, support and guidance on the conservative management and the virtues and the benefits of conservative management? Because it's... You know, as we get it in every MSK walk, it's that adherence to our recommendations that's the biggest, you know, Absolutely. factor that's going to succeed or not on this rehab. Of the, I mean, mm. you mentioned before about the fact that sometimes people can feel like it's dismissed. So some people feel like um, feel like it's 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 not it's made light of and things like that. But then there's others that are like relieved at the mm. the, the badge that they then wear. It's oh, well, thank God it's only osteoarthritis. So. They'll, there'll be two sides of it. There's those that feel like it's belittled and there's those that belittle it themselves. And we yeah. almost sort of collude with them a bit yeah. because that's helpful for reassurance yeah. is to say, well, you've got a really good outlook on that. Yeah, it's not it's not the be all and end all and, and these things do happen. Yeah. And so we sort of collude with that. Might that be unhelpful to those that feel like we belittle it and don't give it as much credence? Yeah, that? potentially. I think labelling diseases is really tricky. I mean, I have to admit, I'm a, I'm a believer in giving a label on a number of reasons one because actually i think it it validates someone's symptoms because they've come to you and they've got a problem whatever that problem is and actually if you can give them a label that's good and it's tricky i mean in 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 undergrad training for instance at the moment is a big sway on actually don't label give them a problem list give them problems and i actually i'm 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 happy to say it's publicly I think we should do both. I think actually we should get people to think about problems, but then actually be able to relate those problems to conditions because our orthopedic and our rheumatology colleagues will always be using those terms. The public use those terms. Google uses those terms. So I think actually we should be using those Everyone's terms. Everyone's going to look on and think that we're super wishy-washy, aren't we? Absolutely. And I think what, what a good clinician and a good trainee physio will be able to do is to be able to say okay right they've got this this and this sign and symptom actually the probability is that they've probably got that condition but I also know that they might have this condition and this condition and they use their presentation which I'm a big fan of you know link your patient's presentation to a condition and to work out what their differential diagnosis is but actually giving them the label and I think if we can give a label to patients conditions then they've then got the power to go to Google okay. and, and you, we can steer them in the best way because I am i don't like people going on to Google but we all do it all of us do it and I think but what we can do is we can help educate our patients so that they're going to use the information they get most effectively because the last thing we want them to do is to go and to find the worst web page ever and then read up about the worst case scenario when actually it doesn't fit with their own personal situation mm-hmm. um, I think another way in, in, if we look at labeling is I, I worked with a group and we, we looked at hypermobility and, and the evidence that we, we found from children and patient and parents um, of children that had hypermobility is that they really wanted a label because they then could say to the world, my child has hypermobility syndrome. And I think it's the same for the osteoarthritis population because because osteoarthritis, everyone feels they've got some understanding of what that condition is. That might not be a right or a or a wrong yeah. understanding, but they have an understanding. And so that they, they can say to their friends and family and loved ones, I've got osteoarthritis in my hip. But don't worry, yeah. because I've seen Jack, and Jack told me all about it, and actually there's stuff that I can do to help it, rather than, oh, I've got this wear and tear. Or, well, what is that? Too, too vague. Absolutely. Huge dilemma, and I, I really appreciate you hanging your hat on something there, because I, I, I'd be honest and agree, I'm, a shameless plug being that I wrote a blog on what called the Voldemort effect, which was about the... If we, if we don't talk about it, then that doesn't mean it ceases to exist. Yeah. And I found myself pitched with you there. I can sympathise, though, with people that, can we reform these terms, or do we need to move too far away from them? Personally, I'm a reformer, and I'll consider that across the, across the profession. Mm-hmm. And so I'd agree with that. 
always welcoming listeners to pipe up and disagree with it because some people are, are further anti-labeling and make a good case for it. So mm-hmm. we'll, I'm sure we'll be able to have that back and forth on social media that always comes after this. But to move on to what I think is the burning question then, when should we list or refer for a total hip replacement? Big, big question that I know we've covered some of. Key one being patient wants to go that way. <laughs> so I don't mean without their consent. I yeah. just mean what for you are the, are the red lines? And, and to bridge the gap to that question is about questionnaires as well. Do you use... So a sub-question mm-hmm. being, do you allow for, say, the Oxford hip? And mm-hmm. We're in Oxford, so it's pertinent, yep. and it's the New Zealand score, isn't it? So is there any ones there that really help to nudge you in that direction? Yeah, so um, I personally, at the moment, wouldn't use a cut-off from a questionnaire. Uh, it'd be solely based on that individual patient. Um, big things that stick out for me are impact on quality of life and impact on, on function. Um, if someone says, actually, I can't sleep, straight away that's a big uh, I'm, I'm worried about that because you know if I miss one night's sleep I'm cranky if I miss 12 months worth of sleep I couldn't even imagine what I'd be like so that massively impacts on quality of life and function so the sleep thing's big in my book cool. um, function does it impact on what they do does it impact on what they want to do as well so uh, for this group of patients they might first pitch up to clinic, you know, mid 50s, early 60s, you know, people are still a lot, of, well, most people are still in work. You know, I'm going to still be working on 100 chances the way that the pension is. So actually, is it stopping them working? So we know again that there's there's a, a staggering proportion. I can't remember exactly what the figure is. I want to say it's like 10 or 15% of people when they're making their decision about whether to retire, they base it on if they've got osteoarthritis or not. So it is a big factor in people's wow. consideration about whether they're going to cease working. So actually, is it going to stop you? Is this pain that you have in your hip going to stop you working? Yes, right. Well, actually, you know, do you want to not work? Well, no, I'd rather work. Okay, well, you know, these are big life-changing decisions. And I think it's those two factors for me that are critical. It's then explaining to the patient... You know, the pros and cons, the risks, I think, are really important. And that's where the age element comes in, um, which causes endless debates. There's also the issue about BMI. So, you know, there's some clinical commissioning groups that have a threshold. There'll be some surgeons that also have a threshold. There'll be some surgeons that'll be like, actually, no, that BMI factor isn't a threshold. I'm happy to operate on people with a high BMI. There might be, you know, risks involved with that operation, particularly in the early recovery. But actually, I think for weighing up the sleep, the occupation, the impact on lifestyle, I think it's, you know, with the patient's agreement seems to be a very good reason to do the operation. So I think it, it's, a, it's, you know, not to be like a scratch record. It's a very individual thing. But I think the people, person's responses to those features, I think, are, are pretty critical. OK, now... We've mentioned a couple of obvious what people could consider red lines yeah. there with age and with BMI. Mm. So I'm going to push you on them and say, wh- yep. where would your what would your position be there? Because I'll admit mine. Then uh, I'm I'm an advocate of a red line on BMI, yep. and I'm really an advocate for pushing against any red lines on age. Mm. So that's my sort of flag that I'll put down. Mm-hmm. Feel free to disagree with it. No, I mean I've I've seen and treated people who were 17 18 had a hip replacement um i've seen and treated people who are in their 40s and 50s um and i've seen and treated people who are in their 70s 80s 90s i think that the the younger patient just has to be fully aware about what's going to happen in the future um, and that's that's for me the big thing so we know still and um, it has been the case for the last 10 years or so that a hip replacement will last 10 to 15 years. You know, they'll get aseptic loosening, the cement will start loosening, they'll get groin pain again, they'll have to have it revised. So if you're 50 and that happens, you'll have to have your first revision when you're 65. That operation, you know, at 65, hopefully you haven't picked up too many medical morbidities, you're quite healthy and you know, the operation <laughs> hopefully will be okay yeah. um, and everything will be fine. But when you have that operation, the, to take that implant out, the revision hip surgeon, will there will be a loss of bone. Yeah, but hopefully it won't be much. But at 65, you'll have to have it revised again when you're 80. You might have other medical morbidities at that point. That second revision is a more serious operation. Your bones might be weaker. You're going to lose some more bone stock when we take that implant out. Um, 
He and needs to do well to not lose some density as well. Absolutely, like, yeah. That's the nature yeah. of the beast of age Absolutely. As well. So that's a second revision. And second revision is a big old operation. I mean, any operation is big, but second revision particularly. Right. You then get to, you know, it's not inconceivable. You might be in the United. Now, actually, the surgeon might say, no way, I'm not operating at that point. Um, um, you know, this and is then you'd regret not... You know, they, so, they, they, so it's it's tricky about okay. when you do that. So that's in the fifties. Now, you know, there's there's things that we can try to do to mitigate from that. So we can try conservative management for as long as we can. Sure. But people, if they're not sleeping, if it's impacting on our lives, then actually something needs to be done. So your patient who's in front of you, who's forty six, says, "Actually, I can't work. I said. can't exactly." Then actually, you're stuck. So if you're the surgeon or the the SP in that you're in that situation, you want to do something to help that person. You know this operation will help them. They might not thank you in forty years time, but they actually they might thank you in forty years time because they've had forty years where actually it can do and stuff. They want to keep working, it's, and then they exactly. retire on a pop that then maybe yeah. they could make their life better. I mean, I have to. I I perennially change my viewpoint cool. on this because actually. I'm some days in actually no, we need to st- we need to work out ways so that people can do better about an operation. If we need to do an operation, can we do another type of operation so that we don't have all those problems? So yeah, the big saviour was the the hip resurfacing, so the Birmingham hip replacement, and particularly the Birmingham, you know, evidence would suggest good implant yeah. does well when the surgeon knows what they're doing. Which actually for the Birmingham, they do know what they're doing because they're trained up really well for it. Yeah. Then actually good outcome because you maintain bone stock. Your revision procedure is actually like a prime. Well, it's not exactly like, but it's similar in bone stock loss to a primary yeah. hip. Yeah, you know, but that might have bought them 10, 15 years. In the same way as the Oxford and the uni compartmental knee might do that for the total knee. So this, how how are we with the resurfacing? How long is yeah. that tending to last? Again, it varies, but I think we've got decent cohorts from about ten to fifteen years. Again, with that, so so you're young, you're young. So the shall we, shan't we? Yeah. If we send them for re, for re, uh, for resurfacings, mm-hmm. they tend to do almost duration wise as well as over the They do do well, and the the problem with not the problem, but the challenge with that the resurfacing community have had is the um, the resurfacing where there was an issue with metal ions um, yeah. so so we had major pseudo tumor or reaction soft tissue reactions to a certain type and not not the birmingham hit resurfacing but a different type of hit resurfacing so um, that's a stink that's hard to wash off then so that, there is still some yeah around. and so a lot of surgeons feel felt uncomfortable so a lot of surgeons would have done the resurfacing and then that came out and then actually they've changed their practice because the last thing they want is for their patients to have an adverse event like sure. that um, so, so that has, and the other thing is, is that from the result of that, there was work done based in Durham and the North East, um, particularly where we've tried to look at predictors for these type of, for the type of people who didn't do well after a resurfacing. Mm. Um, and so the factors like actually, if they're male, if they were big, they seem to have a less chance, a lower chance of actually having this adverse response. I think it seemed to be about actually the type of implant used and how well it was put in. Um, and the Birmingham system reduces a lot of those risks. Um, but yeah, so I, at the moment, that's almost your halfway house before a, a primary. And that's what often people are crying out for is halfway house, especially mm. since they quite rightly, nice have said, don't inject it, that's a waste of time. Mm. The pa- patients are then sort of left between a rock and a hard place, mm. what they perceive to be. Which brings me to my next question about NICE, is that they've, they've I, I'm quite, if I'm honest, pleased with those compared to, say, the low back pain ones, which have been a bit of a difficult yes. thing. The, the OA guidelines, I was, I was something that I felt really quite proud of, in a sense. It really, it really informed the community and something that I often get people to please read it rather than just hear hearsay. Yeah. Now, in doing so, we've got a good conservative management mm. package there that, that's well evidence based. I personally, whilst being proud of those guidelines, don't see that being truly exhausted appropriately before they get parked at my door, or a willingness from all parties to engage in that process, sometimes including surgeons who feel I'm a monster for not just sending, listing them right through. So, do you, that's, that's me completely playing an anecdote out there. Is that, is that something that you see where people aren't exhausting conservative management or is that just maybe my case? No, I think we've, there's, there's, as with everything, there's two sides of this really. I think, first of all, you're absolutely right. I'm 
big fan of the NICE guidelines on osteoarthritis. I mean, they're really clear. They're pro-physio. They're pro-conservative management. Last end-stage resort is operation. And, and so I'm a you know, big believer in, in the stuff that that says. The, what the challenge is, is I think partly is um, less of the physio, but more about that, the, the patient. So I think what we're up against is actually the physio team can advise, can prescribe, can do everything that NICE say, but how well that's actually followed and adhered by the patient is a challenge. And I think it, that's that's the biggest thing we're up against. The the other potential factor is is services and what services are providing. And and you know you're from the northwest and you know it's like everywhere else where where services are being commissioned everywhere and different providers are providing different things. And depending on what the provider, the proposed provider feels the commissioning group wants to have their patients and their public be given will depend on what's actually delivered. And I think osteoarthritis is one of these things where because the NICE guidelines are so clear, we can actually make a pathway that's really formulaic. Um, but the danger of that is that we either just chuck people in exercise or OA groups and they don't actually get that individualised tailored pre- treatment, which they probably do need. Um, or we say, OK, this group of patients is huge, actually we can't afford or we haven't got the resources now to be able to actually properly manage this group of patients what we'll do is we'll see them once we'll give them a leaflet and we'll hope they're all right um you know that's nice guidelines because we're giving them the education bit it fingers isn't it it is and i think that's okay if you if you truly believe that this group of patients won't benefit from physio um but i think if if you look at the evidence and think actually this patient group of patients might benefit from physio then it's difficult to actually subscribe to that one treatment two treatment thing i think actually this group of patients need to be seen you know the four the six the eight times over a fair period of time because we can give them the exercises the advice the guidelines the recommendations but i think what our role is rather than and i'm i'm not a big fan of the manual therapies personally for hip and knee osteoarthritis, just because actually I'm all about putting a locus of control on the patient. So I'm very much a, a bit of a hands-off physio in that instance. I'm not in other aspects, but for OA I am. And I think what what the, the continuation of physiotherapy and the role of the physiotherapist is really actually to try to work out a day-to-day lifestyle plan for this patient so they can habitualize their nice guideline treatments into their life. So that they feel comfortable about taking pain relief. They feel comfortable about the issues around weight management and physical activity, but also that they'll do their exercises and frequently do their exercises and put it into their normal lifestyle. So our role really is almost like coaching to habitualise them. That's the way that I'd look at it. So I think when we look at patients who come to see, you know, who come to that point where they come to the decision at ESP around surgery, yeah, and we look at the exhaustiveness, I think it might be that actually they've either had poor experience with physio because of that's just the way the service is and that's, I'm afraid, the state of affairs at the moment in that region, possibly, or actually they just didn't engage and didn't have enough time to be able to actually do the stuff. Absolutely. Now, that, let's map that onto the 50-year-old yeah. patient that you almost built before. Yeah. Where it was this dilemma was going on in and around work mm-hmm. and things like that. So there's two variables that I want to play out. First one being they, they come in and they say, I've been doing these exercises and things like that. So they've, they've gone up a tier and stuff. Yeah. They've, they've landed on my door or it doesn't need to be an ASP role. It's mm-hmm. just a bit of second opinion. Or second time round, yes. six months later or something. Yeah. So that patient come in and say, I'm still struggling with, with sleep and stuff like that. And they're, they're really providing us with a dilemma. There's one variable I want to play out, which is that they're doing some stuff right and some stuff wrong. They've not necessarily made significant adjustments to their lifestyle. They've, they've been doing their exercises, and I believe them on that, and they demonstrate them quite well. And so they've improved their safe flexibility or their load tolerance generally. Mm-hmm. They're not taking the medication because they don't want to mask it, all the typical reasons, and, and, and they can't comprehend that. So there's sort of some stuff they're doing well and some stuff they're just not. And therefore, in those situations, 
is it, is it fair for us to, to, to really try and hammer home that we need a period of time in which we're doing this mixed bag? Because one, one of these ingredients might not be enough. Mm. But this is the package of care. Let's give this a good go for a period of time, a sensible physiological period of time, three to six months, yeah. before we were to then pursue that. But then still keep them under your care. So mm. I know I'm talking a bit utopian. I'm not saying all services can do that. We certainly can at our pops, and I can brag about that. Mm. But generally speaking, that's that's I'll admit how I'd try and go about that and coerce that conversation as long as they were happy with that. Mm. Sometimes they'll put their foot down and we'll talk about how to mm. list them and reassure them on the fact that it still might be a good call. Mm. But that tends to be where where I go with it in that case. Or is that a bit cruel? Some people say that that's a bit cruel. No, I don't think so because again, if we hark back to this idea about, well, you know, it's an operation, we're avoiding potentially an operation and the consequences of that operation both now and in the future. So I don't think it's cruel at all. I think... I think identifying those elements of what they're doing and what they're not doing. And, you know, if we look at evidence-based programs, so the Escape Pain program is a really good example. Mark Hurley's program is an excellent program in relation to looking at the key factors and constituents which are important in rehabilitation and, and management of osteoarthritis of the knee, particularly. Um, it, we can say, okay, well, if they're not doing those, then why are they not doing those? And can we give them, you know, support to be able to look at the things that they might most challenging to do i think the if we again if we look at the evidence around coming back and recontacting them six months later so there's some evidence around booster treatments um, so actually if you do something six months or three months or six months later that almost if they're going off track that's enough to put them back on track and even that that might only be a 15 minute telephone call um, you know that might be a postcard through the door you know, in essence, just something to trigger something, you know, so that people have to actually reevaluate their goals that they set three months ago, or you know, reevaluate you know where they're at with their hip. You know, that gets smeared, I, doesn't it? It's like salesmanship, or yeah, pandering. And sometimes I can understand that so that can be the case where you'll get people go, oh yeah, I forgot about that. So that I'll, I'll use more resources, even though they didn't necessarily need it. But yeah. then, like you've said. Sometimes it can really just trigger and yeah. help people get back on the right track. I right. think there's a, there's a study being run that's funded by Arthritis Research UK. It's being led, I think, by Keel, which is looking at text messaging. So actually, oh, you know, okay. reminding people about it. They've looked at it in relation to physical activity or osteoarthritis. And I think, you know, just a trigger, just sure. to put people back on track, I think is really fun. And I think for, for particularly current NHS providers, it's working out, well, what's that what's that ingredient, that trigger, which will be enough to do something, but actually what we can sustain and afford. And I think something well, that we'll, takes... We'll retain that locus of control with the patient as well. It's yeah. like that sweet spot between contact yeah. without pandering, which is a, a, a middle ground we're all trying to yeah. isn't it? Yeah. You, well, some of your work that I wanted to... We, we've got two more things that I really want to deviate us now too, which is your, your work, which has always intrigued me most about the uh, activity levels pre and post... Yep. replacement of, of an F well obviously want to concentrate on around here but it's kind of ma- married quite well with the knee as yep. well and then we'll go towards the precaution stuff which is hot off the press yep. so to give the listeners if they don't know a bit of a, a bit of a context on this there is a misconception that sometimes both patients and clinicians will have about the fact that pain is the key variable stopping people with arthritis from being less active so if you were saying trying to map onto why is it that you're not uh, doing more or, or trying to coerce them into doing regular varied physical exercise, which we know is a sensible preventative and treatment strategy, and then they'll say, I can't because of pain. Your work, no, it's not blowing the lid off it because it's no. still an important yep. variable. However, it's shown that, and I'm gonna, hopefully I don't misrepresent it, it's shown that despite pe- uh, total hip replacement being potent and useful pain relief, mm-hmm. and then six months later they are in far less pain and are happy with that process, that doesn't necessarily mean they're more active. Mm-hmm. Now, that is very interesting work. It also maps onto similarly on the knee. Can you, if, hopefully I've not misrepresented it, tell me a little bit about how that, how that came about and also what your take is on that and the why people aren't then more active because that's yep. where the interesting stuff always lands around the why. Just Absolutely. Like. So, um, so yeah, this, this really was around um, trying to, to, well, first of all, to answer the question, does physical activity change after doing something like a hip and a knee replacement and it was one of those corridor conversations that we all have and and um i remember yeah i had a 
chat with one of the surgeons at Norfolk and Norwich, and he was very much about, well, yeah, we, we, we do a hip and knee replacement, and of course they're all active. You know, it's like, well, my mum had a hip replacement, and she's doing, like, mine, not personally, but his, Sorry. and she's doing great. So I'm like, <laughs> oh, well, that's fine, because your mum's doing great, but actually... Well, surgeons like Alec Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so that went really well. So I, but, it, but I was like, okay, well, have we actually got the data to be able to do that? So there was two parts that we did. So um, I was fortunate enough to... Um, have Tom Webbers, who's a PhD student, who's just coming to the end of his PhD. Um, so um, Tom very kindly um, took this as a project. Um, so one of the things that we looked at was, first of all, the quantitative literature around physical activity and joint replacement. And trials data, cohort data that's published in papers as part of a meta-analysis suggests that actually physical activity doesn't change. So actually it stays quite static over 12 months. So yes, hip replacements are really, really good at reducing pain, improving um, symptoms, but that doesn't seem to correspond with actually people increasing their physical activity. So they stayed fairly static. So if they weren't active before their hip replacement, for whatever reason that was, which I think we probably think it's, it's a pain-related issue there, it's not the pain thing that stops them, because actually that's gone, so for most people. So that, that got us thinking, first of all, and then as a result of that, I said, well, is there any data that we've got that we can find in the world that would actually start testing that hypothesis? Because that's very much on, on published stuff before. And, and there's lots of variables that we didn't know about with that. So we didn't know, well, does that have to change over time? So is it still the case at 24 months rather than just 12 months? Because people might still be recovering. You know, in the first six months, particularly after hip replacement. So what's it like, actually, if you have longer periods of time? And also, were there any variables that might be important? So the evidence wasn't really there on that. So we looked at data sets in the state, so the Osteoarthritis Initiative data set. We looked at data sets in the UK. So that's both um, EPIC, which is um, the European Perspective Investigation for Cancer, which is based in the East Anglian cohort. Um, and we also looked at ELSA, which is the English Study of Longitudinal Aging, which we're currently writing up at the moment. And there's consistency in all these data sets that actually factors uh, that, that people, you know, before their operation are no more active for whatever way we measure it. And, and that we've measured it through um, self-reported questionnaires, through um, informal ways of questioning, but actually looking at people's activities and how much they're doing. But it doesn't seem to change before their operation. And then at 12 or 24 months, that trajectory is exactly the same. Um, if anything, some of the cohorts and data sets suggest it declines. So that got us asking and, and the question about, well, is that natural anyway? Do we, you know, as we age, we know sure. physical activity declines. So we then took matched cohorts and said, OK, for all those characteristics that are important or as many as we can match, yeah. does the same pattern happen? And in our joint replacement cohort, actually that decline happened in, in a, to a steeper level more so. So it suggests that actually these groups of people are less active than they should be compared to their age and gender and BMI matched compatriots of that group. So that then gave us quite strong evidence that actually physical activity doesn't behave as we think it behaves. As we'd like it to behave Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. You know, yeah. we, we look, I think we evangelise a little bit when we say goodbye to these patients and they're, and they're really happy and we send them away. We just love the idea that, if, especially because if you bump into them on the street, they might yeah. say, yeah, I'm doing just great. Yeah. We like the idea that they're then living really healthy, active lives that's yeah. gonna decrease the predisposition to other health-related factors. Yes. We're kidding ourselves a little bit, it seems, on that. Well, it is, and I think the other thing that we, we need to remember is that for this population, you know, about 70% of them are not reaching their physical activity level targets at the lowest level of exactly. recommendation. So even if we took people of that age group, actually, only 30% are doing what they should be doing, really, to help their health. And that's what we're trying to achieve, really. Absolutely. So the next question was, well, why? Why is that the case? So we then looked at the, the qualitative literature, and we've touched on this before, but what we found is these three broad categories. So there's a group of people that actually don't want to increase their physical activity. Their, their hip pain's gone. You know, they're, they're happy with the outcome. They're really pleased. So satisfaction after a hip replacement is really high yes. anyway. There's that group of patients that, um, that um, do want to increase their physical activity um, and just haven't quite got the, the knowledge of knowing how to do that. And there's that group of people that just do it anyway. 
Um, and it seems that the people who, who and because it's been in the media this week, there's been certain people that have loved to tell me how I'm wrong. So they've been contacting me to tell me, you're wrong, actually, I'm more active than I was before, and that's great for them. But what I'd say is that <laughs> the evidence would suggest that that's only 5% of the people. The phenomenon is 95%. I, I, was, uh, I uh, was quoted thoroughly in a piece in the Times on Wednesday, and uh, the kickback from that has been similar. Well, it's been both both sides of it, really. People jump into defence of it, and then others saying how, how wrong it is, which is part of the fun of it. Yeah, it is, it is, it is. I mean, but yeah, 5%, not just 5%. Well, no, if we... If Statistically speaking, yes. you know, there, there, there is no statistical difference, so therefore... Yeah. The, you've always got the people that have oh, ended up hugely active yeah. and they will push back against yeah. it. But and I think that what, yeah. we, what we almost want to do is, and, and what I've, I've done is the people who've contacted me, I say, well, that's, that's really great. You know, what was your secret? Because I think what we can yeah. do is we can learn for those people that have been in that predicament and we can say, okay, well, what worked well for you? And I think the, the middle group in that qualitative literature about the ones that want to be active, they're really clear on, on factors that stop them being active and factors that could facilitate that activity. And, and the barriers for their physical activity are around inconsistency of information. So actually the surgeon, the OT, the physio, the GP all say something different. What do I about do how about how active they should be? Yeah. So that's a that's that's a big concern. The second thing was actually I've waited years for this. I don't want to wreck it. So this fear about jeopardising the operation. If they're too active, the joint become loose. I'll break it. Yes. I'll be back at square one, right. if not worse. And again, that fear around that. The other thing is is there's there's um, some group of patients actually um, just and this is particularly the ones that don't want to be more active, you know, used in the nicest way, used pain as the reason why they weren't active beforehand, but don't really want to be active because it's hard work being active. So actually, you know, they, they'll now find substitute reasons why they're not active, and that might be ageing. Are they open to that? As in, are they suggesting it and bringing it forward, or is that something that's been teased out from the... It's been teased out from the quality. It's not as if they're presenting it saying, well, I just chose a different badge of excuse. They didn't admit that no, necessarily. No. It's been recognised. It's the been... researcher's interpretation sure, of that. Sure. Yeah. Tell you, <laughs> and, and I'm glad you mentioned that variable because had you not done that, I'd have gone, but what about those? <laughs> because unfortunately like, we see them quite commonly. But, but the precaution stuff, sorry, unless yeah. you had something more to add. No, no. That precaution I... stuff, which is where you then took the yes. step. Yes, well, that was the, the other thing. Particularly for the, so the hips and the knees behave differently. Okay. Um, so, so knees generally, and I, you know, rightly or wrongly, but I often refer to the rehab of knees. Our knees are bomb-proof, okay? You know, you could do whatever you want to them. You're not going to destroy them in the in the early recovery phase because people get very anxious because it's big, it's angry, it's swollen. It's a horrible-looking thing, that knee, but actually, you know, they need to be pushed out, don't they, knee replacement yeah, particularly. So, um, whereas the hip replacement population is different because because of what we tell them and counsel them still um, and so this this led into well what we tell our patients and the advice that we give them does that actually become a barrier for them being more active so that was the angle that I was particularly interested in in looking at equipment and physical act and um, precautions from a physical activity and recovery perspective so I, w I wanted to know that whether actually the fact that we tell someone to avoid crossing their legs, to avoid sitting in a low chair, to, to avoid twisting, to avoid driving for the first six weeks, to avoid going on a motorbike, you know, to be worried about tennis and things like you know, these multi-directional type activities. And then also to give them some big hefty equipment that's very clinical looking and put it into their house that isn't so clinical looking and whether that then develops health beliefs and are we doing the right thing for this group of patients? Because the one thing at the time, and I still you know, still think this is the case, is we giving given these hip precautions and these equipment since John Charlie did this first hip replacement in the fifties, surgery has advanced massively. But our, what we tell our patients hasn't sort of caught up and changed or adapted with that. So, you know, we do hip replacement with a much bigger head now. We do a smaller incision. Our recovery is now we get them on their feet within four hours. You know, they go home within two, three days of their operation. You know, when I started playing this game, people were in hospital for 10 days. You know, they'd stay on bed rest for you know, two to four days. And it's like, well, actually, four days on bed rest they'll be in the sofa watching match of the day by the time that you know, that happens nowadays. So it's 
it's that's changed, but we haven't changed and adapted with that really. So I I wondered whether actually what we tell them does that create health beliefs and does that then impact on how active they are and how socially engaged they are. And after the that perception recovery. of fragility of that device mm. then is that is that sort of where your reasoning was going? Is like is this just feeding into this yeah. sense that then lingers um, and. Because there's a fine line. We talked about this with with um, in the Sally Lamb podcast, and, and we're going to encounter. We always encounter it, whatever the body mm-hmm. part, because it's nature of physiology and, and these these factors. There is a sensible period of time where, no matter how well dosed up on medication it, they are, it's sensible for them to not necessarily hop down the ward on this new device hours after they come round. Equally, you wouldn't have a fracture. But what as with the sprain thing that we're talking about with Sally is that we need to not be. Over, over worried about initial caution in the short term, but then also we need to make sure that that is shown to be short term, not that this needs to be nursed long term. So there's got to be a sweet spot somewhere. Did you work out where that was in this journey? I know that's probably where you're yeah. going with it, but I, I, I'm this 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 polarizing tendency where someone goes, "Oh great, sod it then, no precautions. If they want to run off the ward day two, let them." <laughs> They're going to be sore and they, yeah. we've got to recognise that they're not necessarily going to want to do that either and we could be too gung ho. So yeah. where did you find the sweet spot? I, I haven't. Um, <laughs> I, I really wish I had, but I haven't yet. I think um, I I truly believe that generally in, in, um, in particularly in orthopedic rehab is we, we're not we don't load our patients enough I don't think no. personally I think I think we're, we are cautious and I think because the last thing we want to do particularly in the acute setting is we want to, the last thing we want to do is flare them up and you know we'll all know those patients that have done that they've got out of bed day four, you know, four sorry four hours after their operation where they've got fantastic local anaesthetic circulating in this new joint feel amazing and go and walk around do laps of the ward and then next day they're good for nothing because they're in agony because of what they've done. And I think that's where your, your clinical expertise comes in to say, okay, right, we'll do that. And then let's wait a bit of time. And I, I, I remember years ago, someone said, well, you know, how much is too much exercise? And someone I was working with at the time said, well, do the two hour rule. And I was like, well, what's this two hour rule? It's like, well, if they exercise and they're still sore after two hours, they've done too much. If the pain's gone within two hours, then actually they've either done not enough or they've done too little. Uh, they've done just the right amount, really. There's no evidence behind this two-hour rule. I don't know where this two-hour rule came from, but you know it, it's it's a threshold, and I think um, patients quite like that threshold because they can they can hold their hat on that. But you know we don't know. I I, I think we we lo- can load our patients more. But I think particularly in the first 24, 48 hours, it's trying to just get that balance. Um, but I, I generally think that we and the patients are reluctant to do as much as they can do. But not six weeks. So what? Oh, yeah. So yeah. the six weeks, cause yeah. it's somewhere between 48 hours and six weeks yeah. that we need to be sensible with these things and not hop on them. But you feel that the evidence for... Uh, you said we just hadn't moved forward. Yeah. We hadn't moved forward not because the evidence was tying us to it. We, you, you managed and yet again challenged a known dogma and found what? Was yeah. there any evidence for six weeks of not crossing your legs? Were there increased dislocation rates? No. So, so we we're basing the evidence really. We can sum it up in the Cochrane review that we wrote. So, so currently we we can feel comfortable about three studies around this topic. Um, and of those three studies, that they would suggest that actually, if you if you take away hip precautions and equipment in people's recovery after hip replacement, or you just take away hip precautions and give them equipment, then actually there's going to be, that has no effect on dislocation rates, and no effect on um, adverse responses, complications, or anything like that. And if anything, actually. Giving precautions and equipment seems to slower their recovery by a few days over the first six weeks. Okay, so if we look at things like how long it takes people to to walk without a limp, or how long it takes people to walk without a crutch, or how long it takes people to drive, um, there's actually a gap of about well, between one and three days, um, which sounds small when I say it, but actually it might be quite meaningful to that individual. But there is a difference, and actually it seems that the equipment and the hip provision. Um, hip precaution provision based on that evidence 
limits people's recovery. Now, what we don't know is how does that translate into wider physical activity? So how does that translate to people going back to gardening, okay. to going back to work, um, to um, factors such as, I don't know, um, uh, DIY and law, you know, just everyday activity. How does that relate into socialising and things like that? We don't know. Um, and that's that's the next thing that we really We also don't later. know if it's got any deleterious effects long term on the actual length and duration in which to do. Yeah. But we can lean on the fact that we'd have to, I can't personally think of a, a way in which that would, like mechanistically, it would be very odd for just because they were marginally more active in the first few weeks of having it, it would be in my mind odd that they'd need a revision of 10 years rather than Absolutely, 50. yeah. I'm sure in time we will be able to mm. look into that, but at this moment in time it would be a bit a bit of a strange thing to just maintain precautions until we found out that answer. Well, this is the other thing. So we, d- we did a national survey um, around... Um, for OTs and PTs, and 170 people in total, about what, how long they and what they did in relation to hip precautions and equipment. And 4% of people responded, actually, they'd give these precautions for people for the rest of their lives. Um, the vast majority said within three to six months it can dispel with these. But that's still three to six months. And, and How many did you say, sorry? 170 people. And how many of them suggested that that was going to be their lifelong advice? 4% of that. So well, they'd be, they help you just, like... For them to be discarded, <laughs> or like, what, what, where, well, how did they come up with that? I mean, I don't like to demonize people, but well, I, it, how did they ever come to find that out or think like that? Well, I think strange, it's, I it? think it's because never cross your things again. I think it's because what we do is that we're, we're so fearful of the complications potentially because you know, we're taught and we've been always told actually these people can pop their hips out, you know, in a crude way. Um, and we need to prevent that happening because a hip dislocation is a horrible complication. Absolutely horrible complication yeah. to happen. But having said that, though, there's incredibly good evidence that suggests that the biggest factor for that occurring is that the joint just hasn't been put in the right, in, in a perfect alignment. Yeah, it's not behaviour. It's more actually surgical procedure that is the biggest factor for hip dislocation. The, we... If we look at the centres that are early adopters for this change of practice around hip precautions and equipment, and I think there's about seven or eight centres in the UK now that, are, that have adopted this, and there's a few centres that have been doing it for, for quite a while. Their hip, anecdotally, their hip dislocations have not increased. Okay, so well, you would expect them to a, a noticeable rate, wouldn't you? Oh, the if, precautions. We, if we were to have to backtrack quickly, yeah, and yeah. Go, wow! Turns yeah. out that they actually did more than we thought. We'd start to notice that Absolutely. as a positive trend, and yeah. we'd act on it pretty yeah. swiftly. Yeah, yeah. and I think in I think what I'm trying to encourage is those early adopters to publish their results because I think yeah. that's the problem is is you know we've been able to ask these people for our personal networks okay well what do you do and have you had any problems no it's all been fine you know it's really really good and that's great well that's fantastic but for my surgical colleagues in Norwich or in Bristol or wherever they want to see an academic paper with that published on and then they'll start thinking about changing their practice because they're scared for their patients because you know they were taught as registrars you do this and because actually they'll they'll dissipate but it might be that they might not but we need to give them hard evidence so it'll change their practice because we're all evidence-based practitioners and what changes our practice is good quality evidence really uh, urban on the side of caution is is that is a habit yeah and but the 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 best way to try and reduce car crashes is to stop driving and that has been a temptation hasn't it that we would go well how about we don't then you know it's like what if we cross our legs and it dislocates well let's just not Let's make that the norm, yeah. and then we'll tinker with it afterwards. But it's just lasted, hasn't yeah. it? It's just clearly... It we talked about... Me and Rob looked into it. It's interesting. We looked into it. Probably two of the studies that um, are in, in the review. Yeah. Interesting. Me and Rob read about, as an example, we used with Sally in our last ATOCP podcast mm. because it was so interesting just how overcautious behaviour can actually yeah. sometimes Absolutely. be accidentally yeah. disabled. So intriguing. Now, is there anything else you want to talk about on that? The the only thing, I just ask a couple of questions. I want to walk. Yeah, back no. To the us. only thing is that I, it's funny. I was, I was doing my slides for the AT um, OCP conference, and yet last night, and and one of the slides was actually should we change practice, and. I was stuck on this one because, for a number of reasons, but if we, because what we're proposing to do is almost withdraw something, okay? Now, 
we rarely do that in healthcare. We usually add stuff in, <laughs> or we change, but we rarely withdraw something. So what we what what we've got with the Cochrane review, particularly, and I think the Cochrane review is fantastic because actually everyone across the health professionals feel comfortable that actually this has been well conducted. It's a solid piece of research. We've actually got to listen to this. Is what we conclude is that actually by taking away hip precautions and equipment what you're doing is you're not increasing the risk of dislocation and you might be improving function so i can't work out well actually if the evidence base was a, is stronger then we'd feel really comfortable because there are limitations of the evidence base but if that evidence base was stronger then it becomes really difficult not actually to do that because we haven't got the issue of dislocation, which is paramount on, on a lot of surgical colleagues' minds. Absolutely. And and from a rehab point of view, our patients are actually having a poorer outcome because of what we're doing to them. So actually, we are currently potentially doing a disservice to our patients. So it, And then if we admit the cost of equipment. Then, yes. The, the, the way, so, so I was sat there thinking, actually, we are currently doing a disservice to potentially 200,000 people a year. And that's a staggering number. If the evidence base was strong enough, I feel more comfortable about that. But that currently, based on what we know, that's what that's the case. The equipment thing's slightly different though, because some people actually will need equipment to be able to get on off the toilet. Yeah. Then they get a clinical benefit, but we're giving it then for another clinical reason. It's not to dislo- prevent dislocation; yeah. it's to facilitate function, yeah. and that's fine by me. I'm a big fan of that. Sure. But the dislocation. So, thing, per- so let's, yeah. let's use examples then: perching stools, toilet raises. Yeah. Helping hand grabbers. Yeah. yeah. So th- this is what we're on about. But they were given out a standard without yeah. reasoning. Yeah. What you're suggesting is if there's a functional need for each or all of those things, then fine. But if there isn't, don't do it just as a blanket. Absolutely. Right and that's it. I think from, from the national survey point of view, over 80% of people are like, that's our one biggest recommendation, that actually we don't do blanket treatments. We look at the individual, work out the individual's needs and give them what they need post-operatively. There's an issue about service delivery and how when you give equipment, but that that could have a massive cost implication then on the NHS because I don't know what the percentage of people would be that really need it. I think that's everything. Individualisation is music to it's my ears. All what, about that. What you've done though is that you, whether you realise it or not is you you've actually ended up in a position that is different to dare I say what Sally has has proposed when she's come off the back of a certain line of inquiry. Yeah. You've then gone, should we change practice? And you've gone, well, let's do these implementation studies that then should publish the early adoption yeah. to try and then inspire others. And yeah. I'm into that. What I'm suggesting is that sometimes that should we change practice, there's almost a militant yes that comes from the academic community, which you're not doing, that can sometimes frustrate and disenfranchise clinicians. Now, I'm, I'm patting you on the back for that, but also saying, can you see what I mean? Yeah. That, that should we change practice? Well, well of course, tomorrow, you know, Jane, <laughs> withdraw what we need to withdraw yeah. is sometimes the knee jerk. And while yeah. I understand that people work hard on these papers and these trials and these lines of inquiry, that can sometimes, particularly on the precaution based stuff, mm. be very threatening. I to think the it's, it's absolutely, I think the. There's a couple of slight nuances. I think one is that in orthopedics, there's a tendency to just change and do something and have a tenuous evidence base behind that. So a good example would be enhanced recovery. Okay, So there was a wave seven, ten years ago about enhanced recovery. Every, everyone, every centre does enhanced recovery now. It became the norm. But actually, if you look at the evidence base behind orthopedic enhanced recovery, when it started... It really wasn't that solid. You, you were picking bits from general surgery and, and, and other surgical specialities. So it just suited the political agenda to it, get people out of hospital. And so. also, I think it's because you know centres like the, the Jubilee in Glasgow were doing it and it was working really, really, really well. And it's like, actually, that works really well. Let's give it a go and let's do it. And you know, we, we were one centre that started, I don't know when it was, seven, eight, nine years ago. And um, after the Golden Jubilee team came down to, to show us what to do, basically, and they were like, this is amazing. We tried it. And then eventually within a couple of weeks, nearly all the students were doing it. It became the norm. We ingrained it. And I think what we're doing now is with the hip precautions and equipment work is these centres have said, okay, right, well, you know, Let's let's just do it. Let's try it. And I think that what's going to happen is that the research won't come quick enough. 
um, to actually catch up. It's just going to happen. And I think the outcomes of interest will be around length of stay, will be around dislocation events and complications. I think where people like myself will come in is we'll say, okay, right, well, what are you giving? Can we start looking at identifying which people really need that? And actually, are you looking at physical activity and functional and global outcomes? And that's where we'll almost pick up the bits in a way. But it's dovetailing the value. What does this mean to physical activity is what clearly just you always try and make sure you're directing yourself towards that. You'll answer lots of sub-questions, but what is that doing to the health and well-being of the active populace? I think, yeah, and from my perspective is is and we've said this time and again but hip and knee replacements are really successful operations but what i feel is actually this group of patients could gain from their global health so much more that they're missing out on and i think the the challenge i have is from a research perspective is saying okay you know fund research around this because yeah these people do well but they could do so much better and i think that that's that's the thing. Do you worry that it, people do look on because it's done well, uh, because it's perceived to be a particularly successful operation that's only got better, mm. um, and because it's so pain relieving that people think that that's an answer, a question answered? Yeah, I do. In a research yeah. sense, so the fun, so sometimes funding is difficult because it's like, well, why they're doing well? Let's move on to the next frontier. Yeah. But you're saying they can get so much more from yeah. these replacements, and, and the data is showing that that suits. Absolutely, and I think the the it's. Um, yeah, I mean, from a research funding point of view, there's only so much money, and you have to prioritise that money into the public need and answering the big questions, really. But I think when you spin it onto um, quite rightly onto the impact on global on on sorry on overall health, then we know that physical activity will have a big impact on people's cardiovascular disease, on diabetes, on cancers, you know, on, on obesity, and all the big factors that actually prevent, uh, lead into non-communicable disease death. Um, so whether actually looking at physical activity as a catastrophizing event, saying that this is a new chapter in your life, you know, you've got the opportunity to you know, really look at your life and what you do and if, with fresh eyes now, you know, let's use it as an opportunity. I, that's the way I look at joint replacement. In the same way as we've done with cancer and, and heart attack, you know, people look at those populations and are like, okay, right, now it's a new chance, a new start. I can really improve my life and make the most of my life so I can spend time with my friends and family and do what I want to do. Really. Definitely. And that's where MSK issues can sometimes be a real access point or something that people will lean on with either being an excuse or a very genuine reason for their... Uh, lack of physical activity contributing to their ill health. A mm. couple of things I feel like I've not touched on because it's easy for us to say about moving away from those precautions. Is there anything that you would find from your trauma and an understanding of the evidence base on hip replacements, and we can extend it to these if you wish, that you would advise that patients don't do, or is given the right time frame and loading, anything goes on hip and knee replacements? Um, I, think, um, I think particularly in the first... I think people should recover in the first four weeks particularly. I think if you think about it, these patients, hip or knee, have had a surgical insult, so to speak. You know, they've had an operation, yeah. they'll have soft tissue trauma in any extensive soft tissue trauma, in any soft tissue injury, those soft tissues need to, to heal. And I think physios feel very comfortable, and particularly those that have worked in plastics, feel really comfortable about this idea of you know tissue healing, surgical um, procedures, and healing of soft tissues. And we, we sort of forget that in orthopedics, I think, often, because we often think about these six week periods it's like oh well we're not going to do something for until six weeks and then but actually the body heals you know you have this mm. you know you have inflammation proliferation remodeling and we need to think about that remodeling phase of what we do from our physical activity and recovery so point of view. Especially the otherwise well person yeah so we're going to recognize that difference yeah. as well we'd actually be holding them back if we yeah. parked them for six weeks it'd be a real problem. Absolutely deal, so I, I think I what I recommend to my patients is is do as much as you feel comfortable to do. Listen to your symptoms. Listen to your hip. You know, if it feels sore, you might have done a bit too much. But actually, it's really important that you are active. It's really important that you you go and you do exercises, that you walk, and I and push on walking for the first six weeks particularly. One, because that's the most important activity for the vast majority of patients. But two, actually, they can all do it. You know, there's no equipment provision or anything like that. But those people that do have access to a gym, then actually, you know, four, six weeks, you know, 
speak to the gym people, see what you can do, even if you're not doing that much from your hip perspective, you know, start getting things moving. Yeah, you know, get going. If we press fast forward then yeah. to six months yeah. or twelve months. Yeah. Do you feel there are any long term not necessarily things that they did that, well, I'm interested if there is anything that you said absolutely explicitly mm-hmm. don't really. But then also, do you feel that those that are very active, so if I was to make a case up about someone who was rock climbing mountain bike Mm -hmm. and playing tennis Mm -hmm. uh, a few times a week, a very active retirement, do we think that that is something that exacerbates loosening rates? Is that actually a healthy thing to do on that joint? And and are there any red lines for you? Yeah, so from my perspective, I'm keen on people being as active as possible. So if they like mountain biking, they go for it, seriously. One, from a physical perspective, but also from a mental health perspective. Yeah. So I'm I really feel uncomfortable about restricting anything at all, and and I think if people are strong enough to do it, then they should be able to do it. If there was a body of evidence, and there isn't a really solid evidence base here, but if there was actually activity related to loosening, then I'd be like, okay, well let's avoid marathon running, let's do that. But I can find papers that will say that. But I can also find other papers that say, actually, there is no correlation between the amount of load you do and how quickly it right. loosens. Okay. So you, you can find evidence to support it, but you so can equally find that. It's not conclusively protective, it's equally, absolutely. it's not conclusively no, no. detrimental. So it, it's, and I remember treating a patient who had a hip replacement and he needed a revision at six, at six years which is, you know, that's, that shouldn't really happen, really. But he was like, well, yes, because I trekked across the Himalayas and I did ultra marathons and I did all this. And he was like, but to be honest with you, and this is N equals one, admittedly, but he said, but to be honest with you, I'd do it all over again because actually I really enjoyed the last six years. I couldn't do that before I had my hip pain and I really wanted to do it and I'm really grateful that I did it. It's, it's about quality even, of life. Then we would, even with him, we wouldn't necessarily be able to know that that wouldn't have been no, a good chance. No, no. Well, we could, if, you, if we were being clever with him, we could say, well, I'm glad you were so active because this clearly might have been loosened at four years if you weren't so strong. <laughs> I know that I'm playing a game there, but generally speaking, we just don't know, do we? No. And like you said, that man's quality of life means he has no regrets. Yeah. And he's lived a happy and healthy life. Absolutely. Then we could we could argue because um, if you think about it, which we haven't talked about in terms of health economics, it, consequentialism means that it could well be that he's been very well. Yes, he's then needed a revision at a cost, but he's also otherwise healthier, which is yeah. a health benefit and economic benefit to the rest of us. And the fact that he's well and and and, and sane from what I used to be holding him back. Couple of things, one more thing, um, which I'll probably, if I, I'll admit that I'll probably shoot on this early in the podcast, because you remember when I said we, you made a case about this 50 some person, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. And I said there's two things, and I said about if they're not exhausting conservative management, and I never got to the second one. The second one is if we go back to that person, yeah. let's say um, that they're, as you described, and they're on the cusp, and they're really struggling, and they're working age, mm. BMI. Yeah. So you thought you got away with that one, but I'm going to try and answer it. <laughs> That's cruel. Oh, yeah, go on, go on. Because I think it's, um, it's one that we can muse on just for mm. a little bit because there's two things to it. There's the, there's the, there's the operation of reasoning. Yeah. There's the should it or shouldn't it be a red line. And then there's this other third thing that comes with almost like a political correctness agenda mm. where it touches on some really sore spots, for want of a better pun, is it really does seem to rile people. Mm. Um, and, and I can tell from this conversation, we, we both want the same things. And if we were landing in a different place, don't know if we will, that doesn't make any either of us moral monsters. Yeah. It's a tough one, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it so is. So if you don't mind, where, I, I mentioned earlier that I'm, I'm comfortable with red lines on yeah. BMI. Yeah. Admittedly, we have 35, and I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with it. Yeah. And in Nottingham, where I did a lot of that, I, climbed, I cut my teeth in Nottingham and do a great yeah. team there. We had 35. Um, and we're listing people directly and that worked well so I'm, I'm biased in that direction so I'll play my hand where are you with it and what's your take on the whole narrative around it so I, c- I can see the reason for having it from a post-surgical point of view from an from an early outcomes point of view definitely from a surgical complication point of view so all the physiological surgical reasons yeah I can see I'm pro for it um, I'm also for it in a way for the fact that if people do lose weight, 
then in a small group of people, but still it's an important group of people, they'll lose their weight and actually they might not need a joint replacement because they find actually they're loading their joint less and their symptoms get improved and then they can avoid an operation completely. And that, that does happen sure. um, time and time again. But then the, the only thing that slightly then bothers me about it is that you then have those patients that try. They really try to lose their weight, but they can't. And and whether it's because they can't because they haven't got the skill set to be able to do that because we don't tell them what to do or we don't give them enough support or they don't want to do it or their in their environment and their social environment makes it very very challenging and difficult to do. But for whatever the reason, they can't lose the weight and they might attribute the the joint pain to being a big big factor for that. But there's invariably lots of other factors that relate to it as well. Absolutely. So for that patient, that's where I always worry about it because are we then saying, that, okay, for you, it doesn't matter what we do or what you do, for some reason you can't un- go underneath that 30, uh, 35 threshold, we won't do the joint replacement on you. And then they're stuck in a life of pain and misery and all the issues that we've talked about. And that just doesn't sit comfortably with me. So I... I would do the whole okay we've got this 35 threshold let's say we follow that threshold and then we give people everything that we can do so that they can get underneath that threshold and if they still can't get underneath that threshold within a certain period of time then on a case-by-case basis we have to review that but they're fitter stronger more yeah. flexible they've taken the medication they're advised on it they've exhausted conservative options but not been able to dip under yeah. threshold and if we are then reasonable, we're having a different conversation with someone whose BMI is 37 than is 47. Yeah. I think it, the other thing that I find challenging, because this scenario came up for the weekend, so I treated a patient who had a BMI in excess of 35, and she tried to lose her weight, and she'd had a joint replacement, and she was really pleased she'd had a joint replacement. And I was doing the usual, okay, well, this is a new chapter, it's your new opportunity, you can, you know, you can really, you've, you've got one of those barriers out of the way, you can be more active. And, I, and she was, you know, I, she gave the impression that she was going to do a real hardest. And I, I left thinking, you're either going to do it, and I really hope you do it, or all the other barriers that were in that way are still significant or we just haven't been good enough at trying to help you overcome those other barriers and I just I that's the other thing is I think for the recovery of most people after a a hip or a knee replacement is I don't think we look global enough at trying to support them and help them and I think BMI and their overall general health is a bit that gets missed out and because we're really good because we fixate on walking for the hip and we fixate on range of movement and strength and walking for the knee. And I just I think we're missing out on the bit that actually could be important to the patient, which is that health related quality of life and their overall health and the BMI. So I, I left thinking, I hope you do it, but I don't know if we've given you all the components to be able to lose that weight. And again, there's or good evidence. Comprehend it's important. Yeah, because, because the time as well, like the time I can understand why physios will end up prioritizing the things you've just yeah. described because they are like well, you just can't miss them out mm. and then there's this almost this extra thing have i got time to sort of mention these other big mm. lifestyle factors when there's a good case to be made for them being at the top of the show yeah and, and, the, and being the yeah. mainstay and of what could make a difference the other thing is that we're we're, we're evaluating the outcomes at a center by center basis based on the oxford hip and knee score and the eq5d generally um so we're not looking at actually well what's the implication of what we do on their you know attendance to primary care or sure. on their you know overall health or how well they control their diabetes or because the, you know i'm it's rare to see these patients and they look at your past, they, you look at their past medical history and they haven't got any past medical history. You know, they've always got something. It'll either be hypertension or it'll be diabetes. Or be, there'll be something you know, there because you know they're, they're that age group of patients. So I think there's there's things for that population that we should do more. Um, and and you're right, we we are challenged because of time and resources, which is you know, but it's trying to work out how we can best use the time that we have with our patients so that we're impacting on on the outcomes that are important at the time, but also the input, the outcomes that can have importance longer term as well. 
For sure. Now that that has covered some incredible ground in we've done it in one take, which is <laughs> I mean it's not unheard of. We we famously had one with Seth O'Neill that was one take, and that even it's usually me that loves <laughs> my lines. So that has been absolutely enthralling chat. We could chat for hours. I'm sure we will in the future. Is there anything you feel we've missed? And if not, would you like to just advise the listeners as to where they can find out more about you, social media, websites, yeah, yeah. and also, of course, we'll point them in the direction of to many of your articles as well. No, thank you very much. No, um, really great chat. Really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I'll happily chat again. Um, so um, you can read about the stuff that I'm doing um, on my um, UEA website. So if you go to www.uea.ac.uk and put Toby Smith in, you'll find the stuff that I'm doing. And you can follow me on Twitter are at at Toby O. Smith. Um, and get to the ATOCP conference where you'll be keynote speaking um, in yep. next month, is it? Yeah, it's the uh, 26th of November um, okay. in 2016. And there's myself, there's Sally Lamb, there's Karen Barker, um, loads of people in the Oxford and the Thames Valley region and, uh, and further afield as I'm well. Absolutely presenting. gutted. I was there last year and uh, it was a Absolutely brilliant day. Can't make it this year because we're doing a, we're running a course that day at IPOPS, unfortunately. One of the one of the physio matters gang might be along, so it might well be that you get put under a microphone again. Jolly good. So uh, keep an eye out for them. But certainly to the listeners, hopefully you've got a little snippet of how these conversations can be so well developed, well defined. Certainly takes it away from the awkward binaries and the strengthened positions that comes from social media where it's a yes or no. We're having these conversations, there's lots of grey areas, but decisions can still be made around grey areas for now. And Toby, I think you've just really shown how we can we can wade through that swamp but still come up with sensible solutions for people to because we all want the same thing. An active populace that really is helped by physiotherapists and helped by the medical community. So thank you so much for your time. Thank massive, you. massive help for that. And I look forward to having you on the show again soon. Thanks, Jack. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thanks, man. Another lengthy podcast, but I hope you can agree there wasn't much to trim there without it changing the uh, form of the conversation, which was pretty much in full. Believe it or not, there is 15 minutes towards the start in which I uh, tease out some of Toby's motives and motivations uh, in and around the direction of travel of his work. And very interesting conversation, but certainly something had to go. So there's 15 minutes or so um, that you can get only if you're a patron. Um, so you can sign up on Patreon to to support Physio Matters, keep it fan funded, and um, this is also we've, we did the we recorded the whole interview on video, um, which is available to patrons. I think it's two hours five minutes of this conversation in full on video, including all the pre setup and then some of the chat that goes on off, off the mic afterwards. Um, so yeah, some people seem to have been finding that quite interesting to see the whole process, and so you've you've got access to that sort of insight that we give our patrons and supporters so uh, do check that out patreon.com and then search for the physio matters podcast for that Uh, also we did mention the uh, atocp conference definitely sign yourselves up that's going to be an amazing event head to www.atocp.csp.org.uk it seems like there's an awful lot of dots there but that's that's the right address i promise you that the event is on the 26th of november and promises to be a, an absolute belter. Um, I think it's only f- it's fifty-five pounds for members or something like that. Just ridiculous that it's that cheap. Uh, you've Sally Lime, Toby Smith, Neil O'Connell, Anina Schmid, Karen Barker, uh, big names. <laughs> it's a little geeky celebrity moment for me. We're just reeling off these people, but um, yeah, trust me, it's uh, some great thinkers there, and uh, and some great debate as well. I mean, the the hip precautions thing is actually being pitched as a debate, which needs to happen more and more in courses and conferences. And um, yeah, Toby's involved in that, so absolute cracking thing. If you if you've enjoyed this, then you're bound to enjoy that. Um, the very last thing to mention is ways in which you can support the podcast on Twitter at TPM Podcast. I'm at underscore, no, sorry, choose underscore health. And then we've got our guest today, Toby O. Smith. I imagine that's a middle name, O, like an Oliver or something, but I sort of hope it's like a uh, hip nickname, Toby O. Um, but I might start calling him that. I don't think that's going to go down too well. Not necessarily with him. I just don't think it's that funny. Um, 
Leaving reviews on iTunes and Stitcher and the like uh, massively helpful for the podcast ratings and things. And we're we're really sluggish on plugging that. So if you really do want to make a difference, then please do support us there. Um, even if it's a bad review, just let us know. Um, but also then you've got your direct ways of supporting us to try and get us fan funded and keep us ticking over as we see we can do. And that's on patreon.com. And then also we have a PayPal donate button. If you want to make one-off payments rather than supporting us on a monthly basis, you can head to choosehealth.co.uk and then click on the Physio Matters podcast button there or it is the hyphen physio hyphen matters hyphen podcast is the forward slash after choosehealth.co.uk and you can find on there the PayPal donate button. Um, you can actually set a recurring payment on in either PayPal or on Patreon and there's absolutely no uh, obligation to remain for any period of time or anything like that. Some people might want to do it for a few months. We do seem to re- be retaining patrons which is obviously brilliant news so if you do want to support us then uh, it seems to be worthwhile for a few people so that's that's really good and um whether you choose to support us directly or, or just try and share this across social media with your friends and colleagues and playing it for in-service trainings and all that jazz that's absolutely brilliant myself and jack march will be presenting at the european registry world congress of physiotherapy um that's in a no it's not april sorry that's next week so November in Liverpool. Uh, I don't know why I said April. That makes absolutely no sense. And we'll be chatting about uh, the Physio Matters journey so far. If you happen to be going to that event, please grab us. We'll be in our Juice Health uniforms. It's got Physio Matters logo on the sleeve. You shouldn't be able to miss us. Um, or you'll, you'll probably get a sticker on your forehead or back. And so, uh, yeah, we'll be there causing some mischief and speaking loudly. And we're doing a live, Physio Matters live um, at the event as well. We're sorting that out. That's kind of to be finalized by the organizers soon. So you're hearing this first, uh, myself and Rachel. Moses are going to be talking about the future of the NHS in a live broadcast which you'll be able to get on, on Facebook live on the, at the time but also then we'll record it in high quality and put that out probably as a bonus episode or potentially even if it's good enough then it might make the December full episode we, we just don't know, we'll see what we do with it but that's going to be exciting, so if you come into that event then great, come and see us, say hello someone watch us talk as well someone has to um, but then also please do uh, have a little look and tune in on Facebook Live uh, for that because that should be a really interesting discussion, big question and answer session that we're going to leave time for at the end to hopefully gather a bit of a crowd. All right, so thank you very much for this month and you've been listening to the Physio Matters podcast, discussing Physio Matters because Physio matters. Bye for now.